Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of the Sodderly 2021 uh, uh, Speaker Series and Common Ground events. My name is Nancy Easterling. It's my honor to serve as the Executive Director of Historic Sodderly, and we are thrilled each and every one of you are here with us tonight. I want to do a special shout out because we have had a couple, two organizations come on as sponsors of our Common Ground programming over the next year. Maryland Humanities and Maryland Heritage Area Authority are going to be making some wonderful programming and projects possible. We thank them so much. And we also have another sponsor that is rejoining us because they connect so strongly with uh, our work, our equity work across a lot of different fronts, the Boeing Company. Um, and so many of you who are members and supporters, you are also helping to make our work possible. Um, I, some of you I already see are joining us in the chat. Thank you so much. That is where we'd love for you to sign in and tell us where you are joining us from tonight. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If you're an old hat, you may have signed in already. That chat is where you also put your questions in for this evening. Well, before I turn over uh, the evening to Jeannie Pirtle, our Director of Educational Programming and Partnerships, to introduce our speaker, I just have to say personally, we are so excited that she is with us tonight. We have been looking forward to this evening so much. We can't wait to get her on site to share Sodomy with her as well. But we are excited about the perspectives and the history that she's going to share with us. And so with no further ado, I do want to turn it over to Jeannie Pirtle, our Director of Educational Programming Partnerships, to introduce our fabulous, fabulous speaker for the evening. Take it away, Jeannie. Welcome, everyone. And just a little um, uh, housekeeping, if you have questions later, uh, please write them in the chat and we'll try to cover uh, all the questions at the conclusion of our wonderful talk tonight. So uh, Dr. Gabrielle Tayak is a member of the Piscataway Indian Nation. She's an activist scholar committed to empowering indigenous perspectives. Gabby earned her PhD and MA in sociology from Harvard University and her BS in social work and American Indian studies from Cornell University. Her scholarly research focuses on hemispheric American Indian identity, multiracialism, indigenous religions and social movements, maintaining a regional spe specialization in the Chesapeake Bay. Gabby served on NM NMAI staff for 18 years as an educator, historian and curator. She in, engages deeply in community relationships and public discourse. Gabby took a two year journey to uplift the voices of indigenous elder women leaders sponsored by Rockefeller philanthropy advisors prior to settling back at home. She is now an associate professor of public history at George Mason University. And thank you, uh, Dr. Tayak, and uh, take it away. All right, well, greetings and thanksgivings to, to all of you. Thank you so much um, for welcoming me virtually to a very um, beautiful space at, at Sodderly, um, an ancient space, a changing space, um, a place where we can also engage in wrestling with long-term um, difficult histories, um, where I, I like to think a lot about all that that uh, the river has brought us, um, both as a, as a life source, um, but also as a, a space where, of course, you know, people were coerced and brought from Africa to a point of no return. Um, where our world had changed uh, forever, and also a place that we still go to bring ourselves back and to um, work towards uh, restoration for the contemporary people who we are today. So um, with that, I would like to 
also um, acknowledge I'm actually um, in Tacoma Park, Maryland, a DC, uh, just a block over the DC line um, tonight on this, this really beautiful um, summer evening. We were just chatting a little bit before we went live about how unusual it can be for um, for our Chesapeake region to have such mild weather um, in August, but also um, being thankful for the idea that, you know, as, as much as we all might um, complain about humidity and heat, it also um, brings us a breath of life. Um, the water that we are surrounded by um, it goes into the air, um, we breathe it in, um, we breathe it out, and that uh, gives us all um, a connection to each other. Um, it's the, the water that um, our ancestors um, also breathed in. Um, and so this is a, a way of, of thinking about uh, connections. It's that kind of um, thought and, and exploration that I've taken over the course of of my um actually of my lifetime and so i wanted to share um, with you especially since we're we're coming from a space where we're talking about common ground um i would really i'm really going to focus this evening um with you on giving you an overview of the indigenous presence over time um the changes you know, for you to think about what does it mean um, to be in a place? How do we relate to spaces where history is not always so obvious? When you might be looking at a stand of trees that are a secondary stand of trees, um, that you might be looking at a field um, where there was a town. Um, you're going to perhaps hear of names like um, Potomac, for example, that means that you are speaking an indigenous language or a version of it, of a people that um, actually Potomac still is, is the, that's a small community that still is, is present, but so many others who are not um, and who we are as contemporary people. So I'm going to be um, talking about the, really this idea of when we talk about return to a native place. You know, how do you return to a native place? And maybe one where there are people who never left, um, people who came back, those of you coming from so many different backgrounds, my, my, um, my, my thinking is probably that that the 62 of you <laughs> that I see on the screen in the in the um, attendees box um, are, are coming from from a diversity of places, maybe not even anywhere near Maryland. And so I know it's it's a little odd. We've all gotten used to being able to talk um, in these kinds of little boxes. And right now I'm just kind of seeing myself. <laughs> and not being able to see you, but we'll have a chance to talk. So I just wanted to kind of create that, create that container um, and, and take some time and then in the next day or two after we have this conversation to, to go out and, and, and spend some time if, you, if you're able to um, by the water. So let me start. Um, I'm looking at at this idea of Piscataway over time and, and who, who are we? Um, I came to start to get interested um, in, of course, Piscataway and, and Native American history. I grew up in, I actually grew up in New York City. My father, who was Piscataway Joe, um, was a merchant marine. He was a ship's navigator. He went all over the world and still came home and he shipped out of out of New York eventually where he met my mom, who was a Jewish girl from upstate New York. And um, I always wondered in New York City, you know, what's what's the what's under this concrete, what what's surrounding us? And we always came down to Maryland to visit. Um, so it was in the family. Um, I heard family stories from um, my grandfather, Chief Turkey Tayak, who is one of the, um, he really was perhaps the last um, uh, lineage holder of um, traditional medicine ways, although that's certainly kept in families. And 
when I when I would come and spend time with him and and remember him and see him and spend you know really really listen very deeply um, to stories about him, it seemed so different from my own life. And then I had to start to wonder what what actually happened to us. You know where where was where was the community? And there is a, a I'll I'll take you through that, but. Um, I do want to position it in the sense that, uh, for me, I, I have taken a, a very strong um, road um, in trying to learn, kind of an outsider insider position. So, what I like to share with you is is not necessarily, um, you know, it's coming from from oral tradition, and then I wanted to see what I could find um, in the documents as well and starting to reach out and it's it's really a way of of reclaiming reclaiming our space reclaiming our identities um pulling that up to the point where i've been able to raise my own children it's very interesting right like we have a, a generation that has a we have a generation who was kind of this hold on generation a generation um that mostly or, or very frequently went away, were very um, pulled away. And then um, those of us, um, I'm 53 now, uh, trying to uh, come back um, and, and also not just necessarily coming back, but coming back to consciousness. And then our children who've grown up never thinking that there was a disruption. I mean, they know it, but um, they're very clear about, about who they are. So where do we start? Um, I'd like to say that Piscataway means um, where the waters blend, where where two bodies of water come together. And I had heard this, um, but I also uh, spent some time uh, talking to uh, language speakers. Our language is not um, spoken continuously. We have some words that have um, been maintained, and that's not uh, that was not a choice. Um, you'll find out more about what what happened. Um, but there are places we belong to a a language family that's called Algonquian, and Algonquian is um, it's a language family the same way you might think about Romance languages or Slavic languages. It's a it's a set of languages. It's actually the largest. Um, language, indigenous language group in North America. There are Algonquian languages that extend all the way from um, Virginia, North Carolina in the east, all the way up to Hudson Bay, out to Saskatchewan. Um, it's not a continuous block, but you know, a great diversity um, and range of Algonquian uh, languages, um, some of which are, you know, they're, they're, they're distinct languages, like the same way Italian and Spanish would be, but there's also dialects um, within it. So I had a, a chance to talk to um, a Maliseet uh, speaker who, who also, that's a, a they're in um, uh, New Brunswick and had a chance to sit with him and also a Micmac speaker who um, they're in, in um, Nova Scotia and, and asked him, so it's actually a man named uh, Steve Augustine. And I said, well, what do, you, what do you hear when you hear the word Piscataway? And he said, well, it's like peace is, um, means to peel one off to the other. So it makes sense that this is a, this is a place name and it is um, in the convergence between um, Piscataway uh, Creek, which is in Akukeek, Maryland, just about um, 10 miles uh, south of DC, and also right across the river uh, from Mount Vernon, uh, which is George Washington's uh, birthplace. And then that point of land itself um, is, is, a, is a distinctive way of looking at um, place. Piscataway, because it's an Algonquian place name word, um, you'll also see variations of it. Like there's a Piscataqua Bridge in Maine and a Piscataway, New Hampshire, which is uh, the, the weirdo origins of why there's a Piscataway, New Jersey. So if you ever Google Piscataway Indians, you generally get South Asian restaurants in Piscataway, New Jersey. Um, but that's kind of a fluke because of some white um, Huguenot, uh, New Hampshire 
refugees from the French and Indian War who renamed a place in uh, New Jersey after a place in New Hampshire, which has the same geographical feature, if you could follow all of that. Um, the I don't want to get too far into this, the idea of, well, how did Native people first, you know, how did humans first arrive? Um, there are all kinds of theories. A lot of times I have questions about why are we so interested? Like when we go to the Louvre, you don't talk about necessarily ask like, well, where did it start with Neanderthal people? And um, but I think that that really where I'm what I'd like to talk about is is starting and marking time. Um, we know that there is at least 10 to 13,000 years of archaeological evidence. Um, we also have origin stories um, and narratives. I don't like to call them stories. I like to call them um, sacred narratives where people have come. Uh, from perhaps the, the hair of a deer. Um, and then sometimes uh, there's also a narrative that's probably more influenced from the north where a woman fell from the sky on the back of a great turtle. And so we, we have these variations of, of ideas about where we come from, but essentially uh, we know that all of the Americas um, has had human population for thousands of years. We're talking about millions of people. We're talking about like the whole range from the Arctic Circle to Tierra del Fuego in the, in the tip of South America. And you can only imagine as we think about what has happened in the past, um, you know, a year plus uh, to all of us going through this horrendous, terrible pandemic, how much can happen in a year? How much has happened to you in five years? How complicated are your lives? Multiply that by a hundred to get 500 years and by more to get the thousands of years. And so we know that there's a long, long-term history. But what we also know is that we don't have a narrative um, or an expression or a record because native peoples uh, generally um, in Northern America are oral and have oral traditions which have been tremendously disrupted. So I'd like to start um, to mark um, our history as people with history um, at a time that I like to think about it as the time that was starting to be affected by, um, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of the corn pollen trail and the invention and cultivation and genetic and uh, incredible uh, diversity that came out of uh, Mesoamerica from corn. And corn eventually came up into the Chesapeake Bay region, probably around, um, maybe around like 900, 1100 to 1100 AD. And we also can start to see a real difference um, in the way that, that people lived. There is an oral history um, that is recorded um, from the uh, 1700s and also in the 1600s that um, there was uh, that there was uh, 13 generations before the ark and the dove there was a leader a man named Adapoingasinum and he came from the eastern shore of Maryland and established a chiefdom uh, he was he was originally um, coming from the um, the Eastern shore from the Nanticoke people, we can only have so many ideas about, about what happened, right? I'm kind of like, I, I don't know, this is kind of awful, but I, I really, I, I love intriguing, um, epic stories. And so we can only imagine, um, what happened, but what we know is that if you can just imagine all of the history of Asia, all of the history of Europe, the histories of, of um of certain areas right the same thing happens here humans are humans and they and they have um all kinds of complications when anakpoingasinum came over um into the 
on, onto the western shore of the Chesapeake, um, he established, he was called the first Tayak. Tayak is the word for the high chief. He established a system um, that came, that was called a chiefdom. And a chiefdom is um, really kind of a hierarchical um, set of uh, tribes or peoples that really um, recognize a, a more central authority. Um, the story before that is that, um, so Piscataway descending from Nanakoks on the Eastern shore, Nanakoks have the, um, the narrative and also this can be shown in language are also descended from the people called the Lenni Lenape or the Del which who came to be known as the Delaware um, Indians. And they are recognized um, by uh, native peoples all across, um, really up and down the Atlantic, um, other Algonquin speakers, many of them call them the grandfather people. Um, they, they inhabited an area um, that stretched really from uh, southern New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, all the way up into the Hudson Valley. So they, these people um, who came uh, with Adapoin Gossinum, um, he established himself as, as, as the Tayak or central chief, started to um, create a system of, of interconnected and tributary tribes and they melded in with the original population, um, you know, through I'm sure all kinds of means that we can think of. So what you can see here in this map um, is the overlay of, of some of the peoples that were part of the chiefdom. Looking at, at time up through 1634, and I'd, I'd really like to mark that probably till about 1565. Um, you have uh, people that are living in in homes, um, in towns, in hamlets, in villages, all along um, every every little tributary river. Uh, there are people, and those people have given their places a name. And from what we understand, is that. Um, people's names for themselves who are also melded in with the geography. So to be called Piscataway um, means that, you know, I'm this person from this place where the waters blend. And that's that's the name that that carries that has now carried through time. But people would would take um, those names and and have their identity very closely related to uh, their places. What we know up to 1634, um, the only glimpse that we really have um, for people um, is not directly from Maryland, but from a similar society in what is now present day North Carolina. Um, some of you might have seen there's a series of watercolors that are now being held at the British Museum by an artist named uh, John White. Um, some of you also might have heard of something called the Lost Colony, and uh, he was he was part of that um, initial voyage to establish Roanoke, and he did a series of of paintings uh, from life, and even though they're not, um, the, uh, people have analyzed them to say, well, the proportions are very European and the stances are Roman, but it's it's about the closest thing. Um, that we have to really get a sense of of what um, what people were living, the way that people were living. This is a um, originally an Indian village of Pamiok, um, and this is again in North Carolina. But we know from uh, the archaeological record and also from descriptions uh, from life that uh, people, uh, especially uh, chiefs' towns, were palisaded um, with a series of long how what we call would call long houses uh, we know the word for them here was witch -out. um they might be made from cattail fibers and they were um these these homes uh were generally organized by what we call a, a clan system a matrilineal clan system so let's see 
what we have here is that uh, it's a really important thing to think about with about indigenous people and and Piscataway people is uh, the levels of of relationships of extended families and clans. Um, this is a painting that shows uh, the interior actually of a Huron uh, longhouse, but it's not really that different than what it would have looked like um, at the time prior to European contact and also um, just, just after. Each of, each of these uh, longhouses uh, would be um, matrilineal. That means that your descent comes from your mother, okay? And that also they were considered to be matrilocal, which means, for example, that if you have uh, people who are, once you, when, if a man, a man marries a woman, he moves in with the woman. So the women's line actually owns the home. Um, they own the longhouse, and if uh, it goes through through um, lineages that are through blood, um, through the mother, but also through clans, so you have a creation of of kinship and relationships that are between um, people. So clan relatives. Um, so my clan is is Beaver Clan. Um, for me, because my father was Piscataway. Um, it is, you know, through my father, but at this point we've also had such an issue with um, with uh, loss and recovery that um, we can just, you know, we have to be able to take our clans how we get them. And so for me as a beaver clan uh, woman um, in, in old, the old days, um, I would have been living in a beaver clan house um, with a matriarch. If somebody married me, he would move in with me. Um, and if uh, if he acted up, um, I could put his stuff outside. <laughs> so divorce was uh, not, not, too, not too hard. Um, and also the, the obligations also go uh, through through clan. Now that means that you have human relatives, but you also have animal relations. So we have a lineage um, through beaver. Um, there are lineages through turtles, through wolves, through bears, um, probably originally through uh, panthers, through deer. Um, and that also gives us a sensibility that we are connected not only to people, but also to um, all of the life that surrounds us with particular kinds of roles and responsibilities. Um, beavers are, are builders and they're very family oriented and they of course are wonderful engineers and, and great bioengineers. So I'm very proud to be a beaver. <laughs> Oh, I also wanted to mention that, for example, when I go to visit um, other tribes or Indian nations um, who do have a beaver clan, for example, there are people um, in Iroquois or Haudenosaunee further to the north um, that do have a beaver clan. So, you know, if a beaver clan to a beaver clan or a bear clan to a bear clan, um, that's another kind of way to make an affinity. You know, it's it's really kind of interesting about, about how you can have that that possibility. So thinking about, um, you know, the relationships to the relationships to nature, right? And we are, um, we are nature. I heard, um, I think one of the best uh, descriptions of this from a physicist, I can't remember her name, but it's like one of those things where you're listening to NPR in the morning. <laughs> and I said, like, wow, what she just had to say was so perfect. And she said, um, you know, we are the universe looking out onto ourselves and, and that we're, we're the universe looking out into itself. And in a sense, um, you know, you can think about uh, relationships to the natural world as, as uh, often they get romanticized when we talk about Native people, um, kind of mystical and magical, and there is a lot of spiritual dimension to this, but this also has to do with deep observation um paying attention 
uh, looking at, that's what science is actually. So when we think about um, the different ways of, of where we are in the natural world, and it's so interesting, there's a, a Mohawk uh, elder named Jen Longboat uh, who lives in, in on the Six Nations Reserve in Canada. And she said, you know, Gabby, <laughs> she said, what's old is new again. And uh, what she's talking about, she said, it's all this, you know, stuff about, um, you know, like forest learning and, and, and that's what we've always done. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. You know? So I think the idea where, where we're understanding that, um, the world is in fact connected, the ecosystems are connected, that we are intimately a part of it, um, is, is something that, um, ha that is an indigenous concept and it's a very old one. Um, and a very actually enduring one. It's still one that that marks um, contemporary Piscataway people um, very particularly um, in our self conceptions, no matter where we live. So let's think about um, the way the forest was and the forest itself uh, was considered the world. Uh, really, it's like a male world. Um, you know, however you want to define that it could be biologically male. Um, gendered male, conceptually male, um, but the forest at the time um, was never a wilderness. It wasn't. It wasn't a, a vacant land. It wasn't a place that was uh, empty. It was so much alive, and um, it was a place where men would be uh, hunting, um, particularly. Um, if you could imagine it was about 95% old growth forest. And this figure that you see, um, this is a shell um, mask that um, was just found on around the other side of the river. Um, you can see his, his, um, his markings under his eyes are lightning bolts. And if you look at it another sort of way, you can also see that in a way there's there's also like they can also be look, look like birds um, from his eyes down and this is a motif that comes all the way um, and is repeated from what we call the Mississippian world um, from Cahokia if you've ever heard of that but like I was talking about the marking of corn and the um, development of of massive um, kinds of civilizations and cultures um, so this man, um, this mask, uh, we also have found carved on rocks, um, in shells, on boulders, and um, his name is is missing. Um, what he's called in Lenape is missing, missing way, M I S I N G W, and um, he is. Uh, he can also be in carved masks. He's a keeper um, of the forest and, and a marker. And so this is um, very much um, a spirit that uh, is that is that was uh, throughout this area, the boulder. Um, there was a, a living solid face missing on a on a boulder right by Piscataway Creek. Um, that was uh, that that my grandfather actually brought some ethnographers from the Smithsonian National Museum, of, the Smithsonian Bureau of American uh, Ethnology. Uh, and while they were uh, looking at it, <laughs> they decided that they wanted to bring it back. I laughed because I, otherwise I would cry. Um, they wanted to bring it back to the uh, museum. So they started jackhammering it and um, he disintegrated. And, you know, and it, it was like kind of this horrible thing. There's a photo, though, right before that happened. And I like to think about it that uh, Missing did not want to be captured that day. So um, in the world of men, what we see here is another um, another uh, John White painting of, of a warrior. You can see him painted and the long, a long bow um, that, that he carries. These bows um, from the Powhatan uh, down in uh, Virginia who lived very similarly to, to us at Piscataway, um, there are bows in Oxford, England, and I did have a chance to look at them. It was really amazing to see uh, something that um, ancestors touched, you know. And uh, so we had the we had the Tayak, uh, who's a high chief. It's actually a, a surname that 
Um, our family has used both as a, we've had a, what we call our uh, Indian name, and there was also a Christian name of Proctor. Um, but our family, my grandfather did use this title. It was one that he exercised and um, our entire family in the 1970s <laughs> with the rise of the reclamation movements. Uh, he always had a dual document. He had dual documentation. Um, he had forms and we decided we would all legally use that name. So Tayak uh, was the high chief. Um, men could also be, well, they're noted as priests um, in the literature because it's a very kind of Eurocentric way of speaking about priests, but in terms of holy men, uh, counselors, war chiefs, and peace chiefs. Uh, so people all had um, these roles. They were also town chiefs named, uh, called uh, Werowances as well. And so these were people that that would um, sometimes be related to the to the Tayak himself, and that was the way that that the chiefdom hang, hung together. Um, all that to say, though, that um, leadership was service of the people. Um, the Tayak, the chiefs, um, the counselors, the holy men—they all had to still, you know, make their deal with their shoes and make their arrows and and um, and take care of things. Uh, so. It's, uh, it wasn't where um, they were necessarily um, catered to, or they were not, they were considered um, to be, you know, they were warriors and, and capable men in their own right. Um, now, what's very interesting here also is that there was um, an, an enormous amount of uh, women's uh, power and and freedom and meaning. Um, and you find that throughout, certainly throughout the, the Atlantic uh, seaboard and, and the Eastern woodlands. So when we talk about, um, you know, uh, women's rights uh, being something new uh, for indigenous women and Piscataway women, uh, in fact, uh, it was something that, that was um, taken from us uh, with colonization. So this is a, I just love this little, um, this is actually a painting um, that's Oneida further from the north, but I just, I just love the sensibility of it. Um, it shows um, women and their relationship to the world of plants, uh, the world of growth, uh, the world of medicines, and, and really women being very connected to the plant world, uh, to the growing and blossoming world. And so um, they economically provided about 70% of food source, so healthy, <laughs> um, right? You got, the, you got some of the meat, the fish, the foraging things. Um, what you call companion planting or interplanting, which scientists at Cornell were like, wow, we found this like amazing thing where if you plant the corn and the beans together, that the beans supplies the nitrogen and the corn is a bean pole. And so this is this is actually a way that people plant um, all wh whenever you travel um, to indigenous areas, uh, North Central and South America, um, you'll see this kind of um, planting that that is not like all orderly in rows and it grows together and and again you know where they're related and this corn beans and squash is is known as the three sisters um native women piscataway women took on roles as as healers clan mothers councilwomen and they could be chiefs called marawansquas um in their own right not only because they were married to somebody who maybe died but because of their merit and they were called Werowansqua. So it's really fascinating um, to see that. Um, speaking about animal life, we've talked about um, plant life. Now let's talk about uh, one of the most defining uh, features, which I, I like to think about. I was talking to a Ponca elder named uh, um, Casey Camp, a woman uh, who's just a, an incredible um, thinker and, and activist working on, on um, the preservation of and protection of, of water uh, further to the West. And, you know, she said, I don't like the word resource. I like the word life source. So I was like, yeah, that's the word. That's the best word. Um, really like resource meaning like 
you know, extraction or that it's just like a thing that you use, whereas source, right? Source um, is what, um, it just has such a different like creative way of thinking. So I have stopped saying resource <laughs> when I refer to uh, indigenous uh, connections. Um, and instead I've been calling it source and life source. And sometimes semantically I have to remind myself of this. But um, again, you can see here another um, painting that was done by John White of the unbelievable um, amounts of, of life. We know the Chesapeake Bay is, is one of the richest biospheres and, and has been um, with incredible effort of, of people working in environment. Uh, have been able to um, restore and bring back some of it and restore it to health. Um, what you can see a little bit along the side are these um, uh, what they call fish weirs. It's actually really cool. I was doing this whole project in um, uh, on, on on New York tribes, New York State, and do you know that there you could still see uh, aerially a fish weir in the Passaic River? Is that not wild? So. I don't know if they've found any um, here, but that's the extension of it. And so thinking about rivers, um, thinking of them, about them as the veins of, of Earth Mother, um, we know here that the rivers are also a little salty, like like blood. Um, we've talked, I've, I've talked about that before, but really it's a connection uh, as well to the Chesapeake, Chesapeake meaning the great shellfish bay known as the mother of waters, which just, pulses with life, right? Like just a, a, a heartbeat in the lungs with the oysters, like filtering out um, all of it when it's all in place. Um, this man is the late uh, Chief Jake Thomas. And as you'll see in a little bit, um, Piscataway, uh, a great number of Piscataway people ended up migrating. Um, I, I don't even want to use the word migrating. People were pushed out of here. Um, people were driven out of our homes. And some of them uh, ended up joining the Iroquois Confederacy. The descendants actually live at Six Nations uh, Reserve in Ontario. And they carry that memory. So I met this man, um, Chief Jake Thomas, of the Wolf Clan of Cayuga, um, when I was about 18 years old and I told him, I said, oh, I'm Piscataway and he, and which our, our name, uh, the Iroquois call us Kanoi. He said, I know who you are. He said, I know who your people are. He said, we're, we're from you. I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. So he showed me um, all this um, writings that they still had in, in their, um, in Cayuga language. And then this is part of why I really wanted to pursue uh, finding it out. And it's all in the documentary record, all in the Pennsylvania archives, New York State archives, amazing, um, in the American State Papers. Uh, so very clear about about what, what, what happened to us. And so to meet somebody, uh, what he's holding is something called a wampum belt. Um, and it's made out of out of shell. Um, this is a, a very important one. It's called the Gazwenta the two row wampum and it was created uh, in, uh, they believe in 1613 with the Dutch going up into New York. And what it shows the two dark stripes are actually purple stripes um, that show um, the river of life. It's, it's the river of life with two boats on it. One, the canoe um, that belonged to native people and one uh, the uh, the European boat and both of them going on the river of life uh, side by side, never to never to interfere or disrupt each other. Uh, so the ideas of, of rivers are multiple and, and important and extraordinary for many reasons. Um, what we have is the world uh, changing forever, um, catastrophically. Uh, there's no way to there's no way to downplay this. There is no way to soften this. Um, it was not unintentional and it wasn't just because one, uh, one culture was uh, not better than another uh, culture at all. Okay, so what you have is a, is a very direct um, intentional program coming out of Imperial Europe and contestations of power um, with the Spanish Empire, 
um, and the Holy Roman, of course, the um, the Catholic Church, which decreed uh, right after Christopher Columbus uh, came back, uh, had the uh, Pope Alexander the Sixth right right away something called the Papal Bull Intercetera, which opened up all of the Americas for for conquest and subjugation. Um, most of this was given to the Spanish. Um, very quickly after that, part of it was given to the Portuguese. And this language coming from uh, 1493, um, which is uh, still in Columbus's book of privileges, which you can see a copy of in, in the Library of Congress, much of that language is actually incorporated right into the Maryland Charter of 1632. So we have the Spanish coming up in the in about 1565. We know there's something called the Bahia de Santa Maria. Um, disease uh, pathogens start um, coming in all through um, all through the Atlantic world, and then also um, exploratory um, missions. Uh, the establishment of Roanoke, which is a failed English colony, but finally um, Jamestown gets settled in um, 1607 as an economic enterprise. And then we have the Ark and the Dove arriving in 1634. Now, something to think about, and this is a, one of the replicas from St. Mary's um, City, is that all of our area, um, all of Piscataway, homeland, um, Patuxent homeland, Nanakoke, uh, was get put on a, a, a charter <laughs> to, to Lord Baltimore before he ever even got here. So it's, it's really important to think about this, right? It's like somebody just, you know, takes your house title and, and uh, this is like two, you know, two and two years later, there they are. Um, I want to talk about losses, um, but also about the idea that this is not just loss. This is a a very direct, um, very direct policy and practice. Um, Maryland, of course, established as a Catholic colony. Um, there is a baptism of of the Tyak. Kittimakan uh, by July 5th, 1640. And the possibility really being that um, coming through the through the charter that that it it does have in it a very uh, direct mandate to um, to subjugate uh, native people. Now this doesn't happen right away. And I think that has not right away, but pretty quickly. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that people were pretty upset and worried about what had already happened in Virginia. Um, Piscataway people participated on the Powhatan side in the Powhatan uprisings, um, had losses. Their main, our, our main chief's town at Moyone was burned twice. And the entire world, as we know it, is thrown into absolute, complete upheaval. Um, there are there are um, different competing colonies. Uh, what's known as Delaware was under the uh, auspices of this of Sweden uh, for 17 years. We have the French, we have New York, uh, we have um, Virginia, we have different traders, and this is a this is a massive um, piece. You can't only look at what happened down in St. Mary's County um, or on the Western shore of the Chesapeake Bay, just by itself. You have to understand that, um, that the empires of Europe were contesting for furs, for land, for tobacco lands, uh, and they were working on, on our soil. Um, so we have a process while this is happening of, of conversion um, to Catholicism. Uh, our lands being um, really just uh, one one flooding after the other of arrivals of, of colonists from Maryland uh, <laughs> take and and uh, our our original towns start to get consolidated 
um, were called subjects to the crown. Um, there's about 90% perhaps um, population loss uh, through epidemics, um, warfare. Um, there's a, a very frequent um, idea, there's kind of a narrative that's been told about uh, what happened when, when uh, the Maryland colony arrived and then established itself at, it, at its first um, site at, at St. Mary's, which was where the Yakamako were. Um, who were affiliated to the Piscataway chiefdom that, oh, everybody lived together for a year. And it was, it was like shows how Maryland was the originator of, of tolerance. Well, the fact is by 1642, um, there was um, one of the planters, the English planters murdered uh, the Akamako leader or king and um, was only, only had to pay a fine. So the amount of, of disruption is, is untold. Um, natural lands are taken over, felled for agric the agricultural lands, uh, completely converted over into English uh, control. And you wonder, well, how is that possible? And really what you have are, are just waves and waves of people. Um, yes, superior technologies and also disruptions coming from different competing colonies uh, arming uh, people like Iroquois or Haudenosaunee uh, who start warring on people to the south um, who are far less equipped. You have people who are quite weakened. And so it's, it's not just epidemics, right? So, you know, because we know that, that epidemics happen all over the world. You have the Black Death in Europe, Europe bounces back. You have epidemics in Asia. Asia bounces back, right? So it can't only be that um, epidemics are, are in and of themselves a reason uh, for what happens. What you have is epidemics combined with all of these forces plus just complete and total shock um, for people. And, and, that's, and that's what happens. Um, we have, I've been looking lately at, at something called the, the Articles of Peace and Amity of 1666, and it gets to a point, this is Piscataway and, and their allies, um, it gets to a point um, by 1666 where um, any, um, of any tribal person coming within view of, of an Englishman has to throw down their arms and announce themselves. I mean, it's to the point where people are so entirely um, disempowered and put into servitude. Um, all of the, many of the surrounding areas uh, where there are losses like the Wycombe's to the Eastern shore, uh, the Doag further and the Nanzaticals to the South. Um, some of the people are, are sold into um, are sold into slavery into the West Indies. Um, I also want to remark at this time that it's very, very clear that uh, this was, uh, the, the Maryland enterprise was never um, really meant to have people live side by side. Um, there wasn't, there weren't enough native people to engage in labor, although there were many that were brought into a, a, a servile position. Um, and, you know, it's it's a situation that we can see that uh, our lands uh, were were taken and our lifeways entirely disrupted, and then what you have very quickly partnered with that is an expansion of slavery for tobacco cash economy. Um, our people ended up really in a in a diaspora. Um, this is a, a map that I, I marked, but it took, it took time. Um, what we do know is that there is a core of Piscataway who stay right within the vicinity of um, the Indian missions. Uh, there, I found uh, that there was actually an Indian woman chief who was still engaged in legal matters um, with 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 the with the with the proprietor um, up through about 1711, and this sounds 
early, but it's actually late because general um, histories uh, show that the majority of Piscataway people, because of the intense pressure that they were under and where there's even a, a this is a very poignant uh, speech that a Piscataway uh, speaker named Madigan uh, speaks of. And he says, we can, we can fly no farther. You know, you chase us from place to place. And he just talks about wanting to be able to live his old age in peace. And so the majority of the Piscataway people with their affiliates and what you, what's also important to understand at this point, all of these different, um, tribes that that we talked about in the beginning um the losses were so massive that people had to start consolidating and coming all the survivors you know they start to come together and push together and push together finally and then they leave in a in a pretty large political group and go up into pennsylvania where william penn has this ideal that there's going to be a red um white Brotherhood place. Uh, he puts uh, Pennsylvania Indians <laughs> that, that come in from the south under the jurisdiction of of the Iroquois. And what you see here in this map is um, Piscataway who stay um, down here in Maryland. Um, a group who eventually uh, goes up into a town called Shimokin, which is on the Susquehanna River. Um, this is a town made up of about uh, 10 different refugee um, tribes, some of them coming from as far south as um, North Carolina. They're coming from the north, like uh, the Lenape uh, survivors, the Nanakoks, the Shawnees, um, the Tutelos. I mean, it's this whole kind of um, multi, multi-ethnic, multi multi-tribal um, location. They get pushed a little farther up and then eventually um, they end up in a place called Fort Duquesne um, by uh, from from the time of the French and Indian War. So they are they are up on those rivers, really, um, really up through the mid 1700s. Get moved over into Pittsburgh, um, Fort Duquesne, uh, then get moved further out. Finally, out even as far as Ohio, and. Um, some go north and this is where we're talking about that some end up at, at six nations and and so we have this incredible um diaspora of people um the people who stayed on the land uh were this is a, a photo of saint ignatius port tobacco which is where that stained glass of of the conversion of of uh kinemakind is is, is put in you know, all of these uh, processes that happen to, to Native people here, to Piscataway people, we see it repeated over and over again as, exp as westward expansion happens um, in what then becomes the United States. What happens differently here in this area is something uh, that I would really like to mark towards race law. Um, you know, our people who stayed um, as Catholics, uh, we're living in, in Indian manners and missions, which do get uh, completely overtaken with the with the Protestant um, overtaking of Maryland. And then they start to marry. Um, also, uh, the free people of color, um, and they get locked in. And so the contemporary uh, the contemporary uh, population of Piscataway people really comes from this very early blending, living in a rural lifestyle, still at the same uh, church and mission. My grandmother, my great grandmother is buried um, at the same place uh, where uh, the original uh, mission was and uh, people marry each other for a very, very long time and stay on the land. Um, it was really like that um, up until the 1920s uh, when there was a resurgence of Native expression, uh, pride, reorganization all through the, the Mid-Atlantic and East Coast region, and then much more strongly with the advent of the American Indian Movement in the early 1970s. Uh, which really connected Piscataway people to a global way of looking. And we're, we're able to 
reiterate and instill um, a way of being again and to express who we were uh, very openly to reorganize and also work towards the restoration of our of our recognition. I just wanted to show you there's um there's a book I, I wrote, a children's book um, about a, a young cousin who's actually all grown up at this point, um, Meet Nietzsche. And it it's a way for us to, one of the many ways um, that we're able to share um, who we are. So I really hope that all of you who have been uh, listening and, and thinking along with me uh, through this um, almost hour, <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm not going to have anything to talk about with them. But I did. So I think for for those of you, um, you know, continue to to explore, uh, remember the names of Adapan Gasana, uh, remember uh, uh, Turkey Tak, remember Kitta McKind and uh, uh, another chief named Wanas. And there are so many names and places. Um, the Indian woman chief that I found that there's another um, presentation that you can find online uh, to say her name. Our last traditional chief was a woman named Nansenan and she lived in Choptico on the Wicomico River. So there's a lot to find, a lot to work with, but we're all in, in place now. So with that, I'll um, close. Um, speaking with you and we'd be very happy to hear um, any questions or comments. Uh, it's a lot. I've actually just like put together like a full semester course on this. So, so I kind of took you through a quick, a quick, uh, a quick uh, walk through about 10,000 years. So with that. Thank you so much. We're going to go right to the questions because there are several and we want to get to all of them before we run out of time. So thank you so much. I've learned, I knew I would learn a lot and I certainly did. Okay, Lisa has a question. If you have been told by family members you have Native American ancestry, what's the best way to identify the specifics of that ancestry, like groups or tribal groups? That's a great question and it's one that comes up a lot. What I would really encourage you to do is to uh, work um, work to work on your genealogy um try to get back as far as you can um and then you can uh take a look at the the location where where you where you believe your ancestor is uh from um there's all kinds of things that happen um with with people's histories right like there's adoptions there's assimilation there was some a horrible system called the boarding schools um, something that that happened to us that I didn't get into too much, um, but it's it's a real thing on the Atlantic seaboard, um, in particular. Um, often, uh, people if they if they would intermarry or have children uh, with black people, that would um, tribalize them. It was a, you know, I, I like to think about it, it's like a paper genocide. So sometimes, and this was not a, a policy coming from Piscataway people. This was something that was coming. Um, certainly through um, the, the e even actually in Virginia up through uh, Loving versus Virginia in 1967, it was outlawed to um, identify on paper as an Indian. Um, so, so I would I would really encourage you to to really start with your genealogy and try to try to pin down you know as specifically as you can and go from there. Okay, thank you. So Christine asked. Um, were the Piscataway hunters and gatherers or primarily agrarian? Um, they were both. So it was really like a, that's a great question, very seasonal. Um, so that, uh, yes, uh, agricultural um, and the women owned, you know, and took care of the fields. And so really that would be from the time of, of planting, uh, like started to gather seeds like March, April, um, as things loosened up, starting to plant, uh, being around, actually women in particular would be around the, you know, stay with the fields um, and the children uh, through the, the growing season. Um, in the fall would move more into, um, you know, what we call foraging or gathering and then hunting taking place more in the winter. A lot of times people would actually um, move uh, 
move out of the villages into smaller hunting groups in the winter um, and, and leave the villages. So that was kind of interesting because what would happen, you see some, there's some accounts, like for example, with an anacoke that um, white uh, colonists would come and they'd be like, oh, these people aren't here, <laughs> you know? And and they would take the village over, like just take the village and the fields over. And then, and then the native people would come back in the spring and be like, what are you doing here, you know? So very different ideas about about that. And of course, a, a tremendous amount of fish and oystering. There's still massive, like old ancient middens all over the place on the cliffs down at um, on the Potomac and, and other places. So really like a blend, like a, a like an amazing, amazing blend of of um, working with the land and the seasons and, and the space. Uh, Diane asked, how do you spell the name of the person who established the chiefdom? Oh, that's a great name. I just put it in the chat for you. Um, out of point gas and um, and okay. uh, yeah. Um, and Michael asked, did Native Americans keep track of time or anything like a calendar? Yeah, and you know, it's it's a very um, that's that's like a very general question. I can tell you for Piscataway, uh, the way of timekeeping uh, was uh, definitely moons. It's kind of interesting that um, we talk about this idea of thirteen generations. What do we have? Thirteen <laughs> moon cycles, and so sometimes I wonder if that's uh if that's an actual like literal 13 generations or if it's you know a kind of important number now when you go further to the south what's really amazing right um the mayan people have uh one of uh, really like the most accurate and and complex calendars um really astonishing that goes uh, with a count. They count for thousands of years and is highly elaborate and mathematical and astronomical. And um, so that's a, that's a whole other, that's a whole other um, incredible system. Um, if you want to start to look at a timekeeping um, really to the level of, of what you would see um, anywhere in the world um, at, its, at its most advanced um, astronomical kind of, of counting. But uh, for this region, um, for Chesapeake, it really is, you know, you're looking at solstices and equinoxes and um, moon count calendars and, and, and stars. And so that that's a way of, of keeping time. Christine is asked, is there evidence for tattooing in this group or just body paint? You know, that's a great question. Um, there's definitely a paint, right? But um, we know that tattooing uh, was done um, all throughout the, the Lenape uh, tattooed and Kanoi people tattooed um, later. You know, there's showing them later. Um, with tattoos. So my belief would be that there were probably tattoos um, and not just paint. I think there was, you know, what we can see on the, some of the John White watercolors. Um, if you get a chance to look at them, please do there. Um, you can, you can find them online pretty easily. Um, John White's uh, watercolors from, from 1585. Uh, you can actually see what I believe is not paint. Um, like we saw the, uh, what I think is paint, right, of that, uh, the warrior with the red and the white. We know, right, also from the um, descriptions from the Treaty of 1666, where they actually look at, at uh, where they speak about if, 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 a, if an Indian, you know, an Indian is painted, then they're considered dangerous. Um, so that's painted. But if you look at some of those other, if you look at some of the other images, you'll see actually very fine lined on the women. You'll see it on their faces. Um, you see it on their arms and on the men as well. Um, tattoos, uh, certainly of Powhatans on the back with arrows. So absolutely um, 
pretty clear uh, about about actual uh, about tattoos and it's been it, that's been a, a really interesting uh, resurgence of um, in a lot of native communities and as well as um, a number of Piscataway people I know it's a big you know trend right like in, in general but um, with tattooing not just decoratively but for um, spiritual uh, purposes and um, looking at at restoring um, original uh, techniques like my son actually got a, a what they call a traditional hand poke tattoo uh, from um, from a, a, a native artist uh, from uh, British Columbia who is who is working with that kind of traditional hand poke technique so it's it's a it's it's definitely an, an interesting um, uh, return to to that kind of body art and practice Susan's question, how do we know the Eastern Shore did not refer to an Eastern Shore area of the Potomac? Oh, um, because, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, first of all, yeah, Piscataway are on the Eastern Shore of uh, the Potomac. Um, and also because there is the the second oral narrative um, that is recorded, um, as well as narratives within Nanticoke, uh, that it they are from Nanticoke, and Nanticoke were very specifically from the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. Rose Marie uh, asks, what are some resources you recommend for learning about the Yakamako people um, from native sources outside Andrew White's letters and the perspectives of colonists? Yeah, I would really. Oh, I don't have this book right in front of me, but I I love um, uh, James Rice's book. Um, let me see if I can put it in the chat for you. Um, let me see. And this is not a, a native source, um, but. Um, Jim worked well with some of the oral narratives. I'm going to put this in the chat for you. Oh, wait, now I can't now I have to get back to uh, it. And also, you can always get an email to me. And oh, okay. I can email these, these guests. So, education at org is my email. So, uh, if you're looking for some of these resources, we can always handed out to people yeah for you. thank you so much yeah i put it in the i put it in the chat um also in terms of like oral traditions oral history um there are different um uh there's a scatoindians.org there's uh, i would i would definitely try to reach out to um the, the tribe itself, see about, you know, the different tribes and bands. There are, are numerous of, of uh, different um, groups um, of Piscataway as there were before, um, engaging in, in conversations uh, like, like this one as well. So that's another resource. Um, there's also a film um, that was made, there was actually a film made about my, my granddad um, called The Flickering Flame, and that's available on YouTube. So um, I would really recommend um, that film as well. Okay. Katya says, I have this book, which she's referring to your children's book. I was looking for some resources to teach my, um, uh, I guess it's three your old class about Piscataway people, a three or three third grade can't figure out what she's talking about here, but would love to be pointed out in the direction of more information suitable for preschoolers about Chesapeake area Native Americans. That's a great question um, for preschoolers. I'm going to put a study guide here in the chat as well. Sorry about my landline ringing, um, but I don't have anything specifically in mind for really small children. Okay. Um, and also, once again, education at solidly.org, so we can share and uh, 
if anyone wants to email me, I'll get these resources from uh, Dr. Tyatt, okay? All right, another question. How far afield did the Skadaway commercial ties extend before the arrival of Europeans? Oh, yeah, you mean like like for trade? Pretty far. Um, I'll tell you what, like I went to, um, ooh, if you look at the um, collections that are at, at Natural History, I was looking through this, they're mostly like pottery shards and shell beads and points like arrowheads and axes and stuff but which is which is i used to have like issues with that <laughs> i'd be like oh god like more stone stuff but but now i i respect it um and i remember that um what there there's actually um there was a a bead of pipe stone which comes from minnesota in there um and then also like the mask that i showed you um has the motif that's that's very distinctive from uh, that comes throughout the Mississippi and World Gulf of Mexico. Um, that that lightning bolt under the eyes um, design um, goes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's um, it definitely shows um, connections and and relationships going quite far. And that question was from Charles. Thank you, Charles. And Ann Cobb, one of my favorite people, uh, asked, uh, were the Piscataway victims of the Trail of Tears? Yeah, that's also a really good question. So thinking about the trail, so the Trail of Tears um, very more specifically uh, refers to uh, the Indian Removal Act um, of 1830. Um, the Trail of Tears generally is uh, connected to a spe the specific incident of the Cherokee, who, um, you know, it's a very, very well-known um, narrative, very tragic. Um, the Cherokee were actually the last uh, of, of the tribes from the Southeast to be removed. Um, uh, there's about 40 tribes that ended up in Oklahoma that were subject to removal policy. So the particulars on the trail, now the Trail of Tears is, you're talking like 18, 18, 1830s. Um, the Piscataway, um, really the, the policies that I'm talking about were mostly in the 1600s. However, that said, what we do know is that there were groups of, of Piscataway who were known um, once they left Maryland as Kanoi um, that ended up uh, really uh, blending into and, and connecting with their closest cultural um, relatives, which were the Lenape and the Nanakoka. We know that they, they traveled together. So like when I showed you on that um, map, when they go out to the Ohio country, that group of people um, of, of Piscataway specifically became, you know, became quite reduced and then really like merged in with um, that group of, of Lenape or Delaware. Now that group ended up being subject to removal. Um, and so in a sense like of, of uh, eventually um, there was a group of survivors who assimilated into the, the Delaware or Lenape, who then became subject to US removal policy. So in that sense, yes. Um, but in terms of like um, a removal policy that, you know, was you know, sending people far afield, that wasn't something that really happened in the um, colonial period, pre-US period. So um, that's my very long answer to say, essentially no, like blatantly no, but um, there were uh, descendants who were affected by, by Indian removal. Okay. Chuck Bean asked, um, do you have recommendations of places to visit in the Delmarva area to learn more or see firsthand? Absolutely. Um, I would highly recommend um, if you go respectfully 
Um, if you go to um, Piscataway National Park, um, you will see the Akokeet Creek site is um, where the where the actual um, chief's town was, and also where Turkey Tayak is buried. It took an act of Congress, by the way. There's a whole other story that um, I'll need to tell in another another version of things. Um, that it took an act of Congress to bury my grandfather uh, in our um, our ancestral burial ground. It took a year after he died to have uh, an agreement honored that he had made with the Department of the Interior um, while he was still alive. Um, that's, a, that's a huge story. So I would recommend um, a walk at, at Ak the Akuki Creek site. Um, uh, particularly, and uh, go around like the, the Akoki Foundation also is another place to go. Um, Historic St. Mary City um, is in the process of, of developing um, more on uh, the Piscataway history and the interpretive history. It's also the site of uh, the Akamako, which is where uh, the first um, the first Marylanders um, created their capital. And so it was actually the Piscataway <laughs> Tayak was like, I don't want you guys up here with us. Like go down to the Akamako, sent them all the way down to near where you all are in uh, Sarawi. So um, that's another place to, to, to go um, where you can actually get some ideas of the history. A little bit uh, farther over is the Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum which is more of a Patuxent area, but you know, it's again, like another place to be. I would have to tell you that anywhere that you walk, anywhere that you go um, along the Potomac, um, it's tributaries, uh, Zakaya Swamp, uh, Nanjimoy, um, the Matta Woman, which is under an incredible threat right now for industrial development. Um, those are all places. Uh, Port Tobacco, if you go to St. Ignatius, actually, if you go to St. Ignatius Church um, in Port Tobacco, um, in Faulkner, in Charles County, um, that's um, a very significant uh, Piscataway site from uh, colonial, uh, from, from contact onward. Brent uh, Chippendale, what are some of the differences in cultural or social sensibilities that cause challenges for the majority of Americans to, uh, 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 from European descent, from understanding and appreciating the first people narratives? Oh, wow. That's like million dollar question. Such a good question. Um, well, um, I would have to say that um, and of course, this is changing, which is why it's so great we're having this conversation. <laughs> um, but a lot of this has to do with um, the view that um, American Indian people uh, were primitive, um, had no significant uh, religion, religious practice, history, sense of self, capability of speaking for themselves. I mean, a lot of it just quite clearly uh, comes out of this idea of um, racism and and also of the idea about like social Darwinism and, and um, social evolution. So I think that that's been a, a massive block. I mean, up until, I mean, get, get this, okay? So in a country uh, founded on on religious freedom, American Indians did not have guaranteed religious freedom until 1978 with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Um, people were still being arrested uh, for the practice of a traditional um, religion and um, that law still has no um, has no uh, actual enforceability. So, you know, we're still like we're still um, dealing with even the protection of our grave sites. Um, many of our our graves have been uh, ransacked um, because they weren't considered to be um, valid, you know, graves the same way as as uh, Christian graves. Right. So many of our ancestors are actually in uh, 
uh, you know, in, in institutions like Smithsonian, there is something called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Uh, so we have a possibility to um, perhaps uh, reclaim, and we've been working on that for about 50 years. So, um, you know, it's, it's really the ideas of manifest destiny, of um, cultural hierarchies, racial hierarchies, and um, the idea that, that oral traditions aren't, aren't important. So this, that's been a shift, you know, but it, it, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of work. Um, and, and we're still, we're still in it, but I think we're, we're coming to the other side of this conversation. Now. Lenore's question, a theater in Baltimore always does a land acknowledgement and then makes the statement that native people are still stewarding the land. Any idea what specifically they're talking about in the Baltimore area? Um, I think, um, actually, did you say, did you say it was a theater? A theater. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we had a chance to, it's been really actually really kind of cool that um, there's been a, a way of um, this idea of land acknowledgement, which is really a protocol that like I always do and most Native people will do. Like if you go to a place, you um, you say hello to, you greet to, you acknowledge the land of the people that were there or are still there or have some connection to it. So for Baltimore, um, you know, that's kind of a, a cross um, crossroads area originally for ancestors, but Piscataway people are the recognized um, native people of Maryland. So um, when they talk about stewarding, um, because our conceptions, as I was talking about, if you don't really like own land, you take care of it, you have a relationship with it, um, that, it, that it's part of you. So um, Piscataway people still uh, see our, our areas as places that, that we take care of and that we're related to and that we have responsibility for. That's what they mean. The more we learn about, uh, this is from Simone, uh, the more we learn about permaculture and indigenous forest management, the more likely it seems to me that the Piscataway were doing more than occasional foraging, but actively also managing forest trees like acorns, chestnuts, hazelnuts, pawpaws, etc. as food sources. At one time, ground nuts, Indian potatoes, quote unquote, were more uh, prevalent as well. It seems this was another managed wild food source. Thoughts? What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That you know, thank you for for um, for deepening that that complexity. I would really recommend um, Robin Kimmerer's uh, book *Braiding Sweetgrass*, which is wonderful about the relationships between indigenous people and and um, and land and plants. Um, so absolutely, um, these lands were, were managed. Um, there was uh, managed burns uh, like of the forest that, that actually were still done on the Eastern shore. And, and I think that the way they do them is, is an indigenous practice, even though it's not necessarily done by indigenous people. Um, the idea of when you see, for example, black walnut, um, there's also even like marker trees. So yeah, the, the forest engineering, this is not just like people, you know, like going around like out there, you know, with, without, without any kind of land. There's, there's an incredible brilliance of, of um, indigenous forest management that was taking place for a very long time. And, um, you know, even be, before uh, what we call the corn, beans and squash agriculture, which came in, there was something called the Eastern agricultural complex, which was an entirely um, different uh, agricultural system that, that was there prior to uh, about eight, 900 AD. So, um, you know, thank you for, thank you for bringing that forward as well. And one last question. So can you elaborate on the significance of the Proctor family group? Yeah, that's a great question too. So. Um, Proctor is a very prominent uh, Piscataway surname, uh, and there are a number of surnames that when you um, hear that somebody is like, for example, a Proctor, a Swan, a Thompson, um, coming from uh, the vicinity of, you know, from from the from from the Port Tobacco area, from the Saint, from St. Ignatius congregation. Uh, 
almost like 95% that's gonna be a Piscataway person. Um, the surname, uh, we believe, um, came from a white indentured woman named Elizabeth Proctor, who had children um, with um, an enslaved African man on the Borman estate. Now, William Borman was the Indian agent. Um, those children, and, and she was she was um, corporally punished for, for this. Um, this was in the, the late 1600s, and it was before um, the enslavement system was codified the way it was later. So those children, her children, uh, were considered free. Um, they were Catholic. Um, they were in the vicinity. Um, they were living right alongside um, Piscataway people who were also Catholic um, and non-white. And so we believe that that surname came from the early um, relationships between um, her children and the Piscataway people that were still living uh, within the area. So okay. that's the possibility. Thank you. Really last question. Uh, sorry, Zachary, if I might've missed this one, but um, I've been curious why some of the Piscataway who moved north live with uh, Iroquois and speaking groups. Why not into fellow Algonquin language groups? Do we know why? Yeah, that's a really good question too. I'll try to answer it as fast as possible. Um, actually, the Piscataway did um, live with their fellow refugee people. Um, at that point, uh, the Algonquins had been almost, uh, in terms of their stewardship of land and the, their areas was almost entirely um, uprooted and weakened. So when you see Piscataway going up uh, north onto the Susquehanna, they live with Delaware, Lenape, who they are descended from. They live in Nanakoks, uh, they live with Shawnees. Um, and the thing is, is that the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people were still extremely powerful. Um, and they were, they became the administrators uh, for Indian affairs and interior affairs for um, the colonies. So, you know, it's, it's a, uh, the colonial history is long and uh, the Iroquois people uh, really did, they, they maintained um, their power and authority and capacity and their active sovereignty um, up through uh, the end of the American Revolution um, and then even into the uh, War of 1812. Thank you so much. And I know I'm going to be watching this video several times to glean all this information. Uh, so wonderful. I'm going to turn it back over to Nancy now. Thank you so much. It was dark in my, in my house. So sorry, guys. I'm ghostly. <laughs> but I am just, I've been enchanted. If you, everybody tonight, if you weren't, if you didn't learn something, you weren't listening. And I think that the, the grace with which you handled not only I say your history, this is our history. This is in our nation. This is in all of our, our DNA. We need to understand that we were all part of this history and we need to understand it better. And I loved your your line. I think I, I don't have it exactly right, but it's history is not only in that which is obvious. And there are so many ways that not only facts that we need to understand that we're we're, we're there, we just never acknowledge them. But there are also nuances to looking at other people. You know, even when you talked about the fact that we have long recognized the spirituality of, of Native Americans, but the scientific inside is not as readily acknowledged that their understanding of the world came from scientific observation. And there are so many ways that we we put people into boxes and they're and they're not the correct boxes both in the way that we understand a, a, a people or a way that we understand our history so i am just so deeply grateful to you thank you so much for this incredible evening i hope all of you enjoyed as much as we did we had people from north carolina from toronto from dc we had people from all over tonight 
so excited that you could all join us and we're going to have to have you back or have you come down for something else this is just too good to not keep the conversation going but we hope you join us we have wonderful if you're here uh and available the week of the unesco day of remembrance we have three different uh, activities going on we hope you can join us for all of them this is such an impactful month um uh, we are so excited that you helped us kick this this month off in such an impactful and wonderful way if you liked what you saw tonight you know keep joining us think about joining as a member help us keep these conversations going thank you again gabby thank you thank you thank you and to all of you we hope that we see you again virtually very soon take care one and all good night thank you so much had a great time good night good night